We are in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, as we continue in this teaching series called Christ at the Core. We're looking at, in the journey of Colossians, what does it mean for Jesus Christ to have supremacy and centrality in our life? And today, we're examining this amazing idea of our lives being in Him. And in order for us to get anything about that, we're going to need His help. Let's read Colossians 2, verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raises him from the dead. And you, that is us, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart please you. God, I pray that everything that is of you that comes now, God, would, would sit and change our hearts. God, give us open, pliable hearts, Lord. Lots of stuff has happened this week, good things and bad, and Father, much of it can form a a layer of crust or unbelief that makes it hard for us to hear and impossible for us to see. And God, I'm praying that you would do the miracle of new birth today, of illumination, of growing us up for the glory of your Son. Amen. I don't know if any of you are like new to Christianity or maybe you're just exploring it, but for those of us who've been around the Bible for a while and you read and you kind of look at what Jesus says in the scriptures, some of it is frankly very weird. Some of it is frankly weird. Some of it can just kind of blow your mind and if you get used to it, it's kind of familiarity, you know, and you kind of lose all perspective on on, on kind of the the craziness of what Jesus says. And one of of the things that Jesus says that that the more I think about it, I find rather disconcerting is this parable that he tells about the the sower and the seed in the soil. Parable of the seed in the soil. Jesus tells a parable um, in the Gospels of the seed sown on four different kinds of soil. So we don't live in an agrarian society, so just so you know, your food doesn't just pop up at Whole Foods. Um, Someone has to go and um, actually plant that food and then, you know, read it a bedtime story if it's organic, if you're into that. Uh, You know, uh, grant that cow a bachelor's degree before you can eat it. And, 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 uh, Yes, you, you are those people. It's okay. Um, we, we are those people. We are that town. Okay. Uh, sowing. We've got to actually put the seed in the ground for it to, to grow up, for it to bear fruit so that we can have something to eat. And so Jesus says that when the gospel goes out, when it's scattered in the, in the human heart, it, it hits four different kinds of soil. The first kind of soil is basically concrete. It's asphalt. Nothing happens. Second kind of soil is real rocky. The seed goes down. The roots appear. Something shoots up. It looks great for a minute. And then the wind goes... <sighs> You know, just barely, and the thing's over. It's gone. Um, some of it goes down, and, it, and the seed bears fruit, and then all of a sudden, weeds grow up and choke the thing out. And then finally, on the fourth soil, it's, it's good. We get, we get fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. And the, the disconcerting thing about that parable is that three of the four possible soils are bad. And, you know, for those of you who are into math, that's like 75%. <laughs> that's, um, said the music major, that's like 75% of... Of all of the soil of our hearts, it, it's impossible for us to grow. Now, Paul, in, in the same text here, in the same uh, instruction that he's giving to the church in Colossae, is very concerned about the soil in which our lives are rooted. And the fact is that much of what we root our lives in, much of the context of our lives, is just not good. It is just not good. It's not good. What we plant ourselves into is not good. So bad, in fact, that that we can't grow up in Christ. We can't look like Jesus. We can't bear the fruit of Jesus. We can't get anyone to come to Jesus because we haven't been rooted and established in Jesus. 
And so uh, just for, by way of review, for those of you who weren't here for the pilot episode of the series, here's, here's what's been going on. Um, Paul is visited by a dude named, named Epaphras. Epaphras is the pastor of the church in Colossae, and things are going well until some bad teachers come in. Now, we gave them the very theological highfalutin name, punks. Some punks came in, and they started to teach him stuff that wasn't the gospel. It was like Jesus and Jesus plus. Yes, we like Jesus and. Let's just go ahead and add on a bunch of other stuff, which is uh, just by itself a warning to us. Whenever someone says, oh, no, no, Jesus is great. I just also want you to... No, Jesus is fine. I just also need you to understand and try to add something to Jesus. We've lost Jesus. We've lost Jesus. And that's what was going on in the church in Colossae. Some punks, some false teachers were getting up and they were teaching some, some stuff that wasn't the gospel. And, and Epaphras was really concerned. And he was just a young guy. He had no idea what to do. So he makes the rather treacherous journey from Colossae over to Rome to visit Paul in his prison and say, Paul, help me out. And so Paul pens a letter to go back with Epaphras to the church at Colossae. And Paul, in, in this section of the letter, he writes to the Christians that he's never met, and he gives them one instruction. He gives them one instruction, and see, everything that we're about to talk about today is basically around this one idea, this one topic, this one category, so if you like, you know, mental boxes, if you like to take notes, this is the big idea, in Christ. In Christ. This one idea of being in Christ, and so uh, everything that we're about to say is concerned with what it looks like for your life to be rooted, established, and grown up in Christ. Paul gives us a command, an instruction. Here it is in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted in him, built up in him, and established in the faith that is trusting in him, just as you were taught. And the result of that should be abounding in thanksgiving. So today, in, in what we're looking at, I'm, I'm going to give you... Um, give you a, basically a try to answer three questions. The first thing is we're going to ask, ask how does being in Christ get defeated in our lives? What keeps us from being rooted in Christ? The second question is what does it mean to be in Christ? And then the third question we're going to answer is how do we experience life in Christ? How does living life in Christ get defeated, get ruined in our life? What does it mean to be rooted and established in Christ? And then how in the world do we do that? How do we experience that thing? Paul just gave us an interesting command, and I want to I look at this with you because there's some interesting prepositional phrases in here. He says, just as you received Christ, walk in him, rooted in him, built up in him, and established in faith in him. And so Paul is really concerned that we grab onto this idea that something about the context of the Christian life has to be rooted in Jesus Christ. And the fact is that many of us, we plant our lives not in Jesus. We plant our lives not in Jesus. What keeps us, what destroys, what defeats us from planting our lives in Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing Paul says here in, in verse 8, he says this. He gives us the command, look, root, grow, establish, run, experience all of life in the context of Jesus Christ. And then he gives us a warning, the thing that's going to keep us from doing that. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. Now, typically, this is where people like you would expect a guy like me to say, so, you know, just stop all that learning. <laughs> like, any, anything that looks like learning, I mean, philosophy, wisdom, and anything that, that we call knowledge, you know, just be real suspect. And then this is one of those verses that well-meaning Christians have taken out of context to sort of justify uh, lobotomizing themselves and then just living only this sort of emotional faith. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. I don't think that's what Paul is saying because Paul was smarter than you. Yep, you too. But I go to Harvard. Yeah, I know. Big deal. Uh, he, <laughs> smarter, he's smarter than you. But I, I'm taking underwater basket weaving with Professor so-and-so. Great. Um, Paul, Paul could speak, write, and, and converse in three, the three academic languages of his day. He was, um, I mean, he was educated at the finest institutions under the finest people. I mean, he understands metaphysics and philosophy in a way that you and I, we're just not going to get it. And so I really doubt that his big instruction to the church is, hey, just make yourself kind of stupid. Just take yourself and, and you know, kind of laser scalpel yourself out of intelligence, and then it'll be fine. <laughs> Then it'll be fine. Then it'll be fine in Jesus. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is there is a way to root yourself in bad ideas that look like good ideas. Even good ideas that our culture is like, oh, these are very good ideas. We should all just, you know, do, do this. Very, very good ideas. You know, we should always be suspect of a culture that's constantly in flux, constantly failing, and constantly praising itself. We should always be in, in just a little bit suspect of the big ideas of a culture that's constantly changing, 
constantly pleased with itself and always dropping the ball. I mean, in 2006 and a half, we were very impressed with our, our understanding of uh, the economy, weren't we? We were great. And then 2007 happened, and we are like, oh, where'd all the money go? <laughs> Half of you in here were like 10. Okay. Um, I lost what was to me a big pile of money, and it became a no pile of money. Okay, but because we, we were all very like, oh, no, we totally get all this. And we are like, oh, or we don't get any of this. But now we're all to believe we all get it. We should be very suspect of a culture that's constantly like, we're very intelligent, and then constantly screwing everything up, but constantly applauding ourselves for it, right? We should just be suspect. Doesn't mean we should be negative, doesn't mean we should be cynical. We should just go, you know, you're probably not the source of unchanging, timeless reality. That's a safe, fairly phrased assumption, I think. And so what Paul is saying is like, hey, be careful what you root your life in. So what defeats being rooted in Christ? What defeats that? First of all, um, Paul, now Paul n notices a couple of things. He calls it um, captive by philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, elemental spirits. All of this uh, kind of alludes to what the Colossians were struggling with. Now, it's funny, in, in my world and in reading a lot of commentaries on the book of Colossians, it's interesting and kind of funny to watch, uh, you know, Christian academics argue back and forth about the exact nature of the weird beliefs that the Colossians were struggling with. The fact is, we don't really know what they were. They're kind of in the neighborhood of some weird Gnosticism, which was this idea that God kind of made the world by accident and doesn't want to know us, so he creates all these like different levels of angelic beings, and I don't know, it sounds a little bit too Dungeons and Dragons for me, so it's not really that important what, um, I just defended like two college men. Uh, good, good. Um, <laughs> because in doing that, you might get married now, so that's exciting. Um, <laughs> Do you want to come to my room and play Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> no. Jeez, I thought she'd say yes. Um, <laughs> I just helped some of you. It wasn't in the message at all. That was just from the Holy Spirit. See that? <laughs> I just helped somebody. All right. We'll scrub that from the podcast later. It'll make sense in here, though. <laughs> Philosophy and empty deceit. There are some false soils that you can lay the roots of your life into that will end up killing you. The first of those soils um, has to do with just a soil of empty philosophy, just living in light and established in your own intelligence. The fact is, lots of you are very smart, very smart as the world counts smartness. And so it's, it would be very easy for you to lay the root of your lives in your ability to understand stuff. And so you come to God, and instead of trusting Christ and living life in Christ, what you do is trust in your ability to get how he works, right? Instead of, you know, you looking at the clock and trusting the time it says, you trust it on the basis of your ability to understand how all the cogs work, and you approach God the same way. No, no, I, I trust, I don't trust you, the person, I'm just going to trust my ability to understand how you think and how you work, and it doesn't work like that, because that'd be a little bit like my four-year-old understanding my income taxes, right? Big crayon, spaceship on there somewhere, it's just not going to be what the IRS would accept, do you understand? You, we do the same thing with him. Rooting our lives in our own intelligence makes us falsely rooted and will end up choking us, killing us, it's not going to work. Some of you, however, you have no problem with that. You're very spiritual. You're like, oh no, I like church. I'm very spiritual, spiritually open. Instead of rooting your life in the false soil of intelligence, you root your life in the false soil of just spirituality, right? We know who you are. You smell like incense all the time, right? You, you, if you had a poodle, it'd be named Deepak Chopra, right? You love, you love herbal tea of all kinds. This is you, right? And you're very spiritually open. You're, you're, wandering, and you kind of float around, and you're like, you know, you wouldn't ever want to be offensive, but you're very offended by people who think that they know God. Rooting your lives in spirituality is based on a false presupposition, namely that spirituality is just sort of passive. It's like water, and you can just sort of interact with it and manipulate it like you want. But the scriptures are very clear. That's not the nature of the spiritual world in which we find ourselves. Just as the physical world in which we find ourselves is fallen, the scriptures also say there is a whole spiritual realm of war and battle against us, such that even the devil himself walks around looking like an angel of light, so be careful what you interact with and what you spiritually open yourself up to. The business card that spirit hands you might not be its actual identity. That's what the scriptures say. So Paul wants to say, listen, don't 
Don't establish your life in the soil of your own intelligence. And don't establish your life in the soil of some sort of make it up as you go, choose your own adventure spirituality. Now, now there's a group of you in here right now that's like, yeah, get them. Get them. You tell those people who think they're too smart. You tell those people who are all, you know, spiritual and wearing crystals and stuff. Get them. <laughs> and you're the third false kind of soil. You're the religious performance guy. You're the guy who has got to have his, his statement of faith, you know, all, all the T's cross and dies eyes dotted. Dies odded. No. <laughs> You're the guy who's got to have it all lined up. You're the guy who's, who doesn't love and trust and obey Christ. You love and trust and obey systems and doctrine and obedience, and theology, and you've made things that were meant to tell you about Jesus, the signs that point to Jesus, the thing instead of Jesus. That's called religion. It's called pride, and it is a soil that will make you produce poison. So Paul warns us, these things will defeat the life of the man or woman who's trying to grow up rooted and established in Christ. I mean, these, these soils produce nothing but long-term death and, and brokenness and sadness. So what, what do we do? How do we look rooted in Christ? What does it mean? Because, I mean, let, let's look back at this now. We're told to be rooted in Christ, built up in Christ, established in Christ. Now, you, you've got to notice here that Paul is totally mixing his metaphors. Like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Walk in Christ? Be built in Christ like a building? Or like rooted in Christ like a plant? Like, what are you doing, Paul? I mean, why, why are we mixing our, our metaphor so much? It's very hard to follow someone who mixes their metaphor. Well, there's a reason. It's because the reality of life in Christ, the reality of union with Christ, is simply beyond the vanishing point of our language. Does this make sense? There are certain things about life in God, men and women, that are beyond your ability to get to merely by words and description. They don't work from the mind in. They work from the spirit out. And so Paul's saying, union with Christ, life with Christ, being connected in Christ, it, it, it's kind of like being planted in soil. It's kind of like being a building built up. It's kind of like walking constantly on a road. It's, it's being in constant communion and fellowship. And there'll be two or three other metaphors that Paul will use in his other writings to describe this reality that theologians call union with Christ, without which we don't get Jesus. And that's what we're talking about today. What defeats being in Christ. What does it look like to be in Christ? Well, Paul's going Paul's to unpack that a little bit for us. Now, he gets us past the warning, and then in verse 9, he says, for in him that is Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Now, okay, hold, hold on just a second, Paul. I think you, <laughs> let, me, let me correct your language. And some translators actually do this. They come to Paul and they go, oh, Paul, you, you used in and you meant to use with. And they, they come and they, some of you will have a, a version of the scriptures that get this wrong. But he actually says, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him. That doesn't make any sense. But we can be filled with and we can fill with, but being filled in, how, how, what does that look like? What does that possibly mean? Well, this is the fourth time Paul has used this language of mutual indwelling. The first time he's going to talk about Jesus, right? Look back over to chapter 1 at the very beginning. Paul kind of thunders down with this description of Jesus. He says, in Jesus, all the fullness of God dwells bodily, and he, Jesus, is fully God. Do you see that that's a two-way street? Do you see what, G what Paul is describing as some, some, a theological reality that is just a little bit kind of, you know, you think about it long enough and you'll get an aneurysm, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just a little bit beyond our ability to, to wrap our minds fully around, okay? We might not be able to comprehend it, but we can apprehend it, right? We might not be able to get our arms all the way around it, but we surely can rightly touch it. What Paul is saying is, in the Godhead, Christ is fully God, and all of God is fully present in Jesus Christ. That's the first time he mentions it. And then three times, we are told that we are to have, we are to understand the reality that Christ is in us, and we are in him. Christ is in us, and we are in him. Now, the, the kind of summary of all that, we just say, well, we're in Christ, or union with Christ, or experience with Christ, and we know now what defeats that, but what in the world does that mean? Imagine this picture. Being filled with Christ, and 
Experiencing union with Christ and life in Christ isn't like holding a cup under a faucet. It's like taking the cup of your life and plunging it into the ocean such that the ocean is now in the cup and you are fully present in the ocean. Does this make sense? That's what life with Christ is like. What Paul wants us to understand is that your life, you can't fully contain him, but you can be fully present in him and he can grow in you. Does this make sense to you? Is this, are, are we grabbing onto the now? The, again, this is one of those mystical, mysterious realities of the Christian experience. Now, I realize that this is going to be automatically hard for us because this is 2013. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, surrounded by really, really smart people. And so I'm trying to describe to you an experiential reality with words. And so now what I'm hoping is going to begin to happen is you're, something's burning on the inside of you to just experience it. Just experience it. You know, I can, I can explain to you marriage but it all falls short until you experience it. I, I, I can explain to you love. I can explain to you true friendship. But it all just kind of doesn't quite get there until you've really had a friend. This is much more than both of those small, cheap imitations. This is union with Christ. This is life in Christ. And so Paul says... In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled with him. You have been filled with the one in whom all fullness of deity dwells. And that is an amazing reality to contend with. You have been filled with him, who is the head of all rule and authority. He is the Lord. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, what does union with Christ mean? The first thing about it is that it's covenantal. It's covenantal. If you are in Christ, in coming to Jesus, it is like getting married but more. Marriage is the only thing that we have these days that even remotely resembles uh, a covenant in the scriptures. But it is, it is this idea that in Christ, you are now in a relationship where he is fully committed to you. It's not just an emotional thing. Many of you, you come to Jesus because you have a moment. You cry, you like the song, the bass guitar and the bass drum hit you in the gut just right, and you're like, yeah, I think God might be real. Like, it's just sort of an emotional thing. It's sort of an emotional thing, but it's not a covenantal thing. And what Paul is saying is, no, no, Colossians, no, no, Bostonians, no, no, Canterburyans, no, no, students, no, no, professionals, no, no, moms and dads and sons and daughters. This thing, it, it's covenantal. When Christ comes and you experience union with him, when the cup of your life is plunged into the bottomless and breathless ocean of Jesus, you are now in covenant with him. He uses the language of circumcision. Circumcision is the Old Testament sign of covenant with God, where you would say to God, I am fully yours, and God would say, I am unendingly committed to you. Today, we don't use that covenant sign. It's been superseded by another one called baptism. Frankly, that would make new conversion weird. We're having a baptism Sunday in a couple of weeks. I'm glad it's not a circumcision Sunday, because that would just make the whole matter strange for all of you, um, and, and me, frankly. Uh, have a surgical license, and are we all getting that really uncomfortable mental picture right now? Good. Yeah, let that sit there. Good, okay. And we all said, Jesus, thank you for baptism. We like that one better. It's a little bit more convenient and clean. He says, this covenantal thing, you've received this covenantal sign, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the one who raises him from the dead. Now, being in union with Christ means you're in covenant with him. And in covenant with him, we get this new sign called baptism, which means we're not only united with Christ in this sort of metaphysical sort of way, we're united with him in his death. Many of you, you come to church, and what you expect a guy like me to say is, hey, this is how to be a Christian, and today we're going to talk about this step in how to be a Christian, so go be better Christians, let's pray. And what you don't expect me to say is, hey, Come and die. You want life in Christ? You want to experience the infinite God filling every nook and cranny of your soul? Then be united with the death of his son. But if you'll listen, that's the best news in the world. It's the best news in the world because the very thing your flesh needs, the very thing that your pain needs, the very thing that your sin needs, the very thing that the scars of your life just perpetuated upon you by others need isn't remedy, isn't surgery, isn't therapy, it's death, it's burial, and then it's new life. 
It's new life. We're going to be doing a baptism in a, a couple of weeks, and we're going to be baptizing some people. And some of you in here have never experienced baptism, and you need to, because it is one of the two ways that God has given us physically to experience union with him. It is one of the only ways that God has given us to, ex- to physically experience union with Christ. And if you haven't experienced the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in baptism, then I'm just inviting you to come and just take part in this awesome means of grace for you to understand and experience what it means to have life in Christ. Because in baptism, you're united with his death and his burial and, re- and his resurrection. And his resurrection. Paul is reminding the Colossians, listen, if, you've been, if you're a believer, if you're in the church, you've been united with, with the death of Christ and the burial of Christ and the life of Christ. He says, you've been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through, the, through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, many of you, you're in here and, and you get that death thing. You, you have no problem with that. In fact, I mean, if we were to baptize you, the way you live your Christian life, you'd just still be in the water. Just kind of plop you in and drown you. And that's kind of what you imagine the life to be. Now, I guess we could do that. It would be illegal. But you could meet Jesus right then. Um, (laughs) It would be... (laughs) We wouldn't be here next Sunday. Be church on the road. (laughs) Um, Probably ought to scrub this from the podcast, too, just in case that ever accidentally happens. We don't want that to be brought up in court. Okay. (laughs) Now, Jesus... We're not only united with his, his death and his burial, but with his resurrection. You know what that means? It means the church isn't a big gathering of Christian losers. It isn't a big gathering of people who are just defeated and funky about their sin. It isn't a big gathering of people who are just sitting around having a big therapeutic moment going, well, life's really hard and things are really hard and I'm really sinful. Let's pray, brother. I mean, it isn't about that. Look, life is hard. Things are hard. Sin is horrible. But... You've not only been united with the life and death of Christ, you've been united by faith in him with his resurrection. That means there's some new life on the other side of that death. So in coming to Jesus and saying, I embrace the death of Jesus for me, you're also saying, and the new life of Christ for me. You know, the reason we don't have a crucifix here with Christ hanging dead on the cross is because he's not there anymore. Oh, he was, but he's not anymore. Now he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, ruling and reigning, overseeing all things until the moment he returns. And when he comes back, it won't be as a lamb, it will be as a lion. It will be as the ruler and the sovereign judge of all the earth. And we will be divided. And he will say, you, you are in me, I know you. And then others depart from me, I never knew you. And that's why this precious doctrine of life in him, union with him, is so critical. It's so important, church, that you understand that Christianity is not about doing, which turns into being. Christianity is about being, which overflows in doing. Does that make sense? One is not Christianity. It is false Religion, it is fake. It might look a lot like church. It might smell a lot like church, but it is not real church. And it's so tempting and it's so easy to embrace that, embrace a program, embrace intelligence, embrace some false soil, hoping that will be programmatic for your redemption and rescue. And what Paul is saying is, no, 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 no. Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted in him, built up in him, and established in faith in him, just as you were taught. Don't depart from that. Don't leave that. Grow up in that. Put your roots down deep in the soil of Christ and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold in your life. You've been united with his life and his death and his resurrection. And not just his resurrection, but his eternal life. It says this in verse 13. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Just so you know, that's y'all and me. That's us. We were dead in our trespasses and the and the uncircumcision of our flesh. That means we were out of the covenant promises of God. 
God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all of our sins. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It means now in union with Christ, if if our lives have been drowned in the ocean of Jesus and all of his grace, not only do we die with him and we resurrect with him, but we now have new and everlasting life in him such that he could say, I came not that they might have a little bit of life and a little bit of victory, but they might have life and have it to the full. Those are the words of your Savior. And only really in union with Him do we get that. Only by living in Christ do we understand what what this overflowing life in Him means. You can tell by looking at some of your faces that you're like, Pastor, I get you. Like, I agree that might be possible, but I am not experiencing that at all. Like, all right, sounds neat. That is not true in here. Which takes us to the third concern. We know what being in Christ now is about. What it looks like. But how in the world do we get there? How in the world do we get there? Well, I think the answer is in the command. Paul gives us a command. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Be rooted in Him. Be built up in Him established in him. See, Paul gives us some verbs here. Receive him. Root in him. Build up in him. Be established in him. Do you see, this is not a a thing where I'm going to tell you, so, so do these three things so that you can experience life in Christ. What I'm asking you to do is to receive him in all of his fullness into your heart into your life, into the very center of your being. That's why it's called Christ at the core, not Christ on the side, like ketchup, to dip your life in so that you like it a little better. Funny but true. Christ at the core. Christ at the center. Christ at the head and the tail. Christ all the way around and all the way within. Christ, receive Christ and be rooted in Christ. We just celebrated the, the you know, October 31st. I, I realize you all got dressed up for Reformation Day. Congratulations. Um, I'm sure that's what you were celebrating. Halloween just happens to be on Reformation Day, and that is the one day of the year where we remember this idea of sola Christus, Christ alone. And the sufficiency and the supremacy and the centrality of Jesus Christ alone in all of life, for all of life, in every nook and cranny of life so that you might have infinite and eternal life forever. That's what it's about. And how do you do that? It's by, well, it's by plucking your life up out of this soil of your own intelligence and your own religious performance and your own spirituality and planting it firmly in Christ and in Christ alone. In Christ and in Christ alone. What does that look like? You know, it looks like all kinds of things. It looks like you just being overrun by the word of God. You know, we preach, you know, line by line, verse by verse in here, but sometimes you just got to sit down and read 30 Psalms and let them wash over you like waves. Let them wash over you like waves and say, okay, the word of the Lord is good. It's pure. It's clean. Help me, God. Sometimes it's you. You got to just get alone and you got to pray, God, I heard you say once in your word something about abundant life and rivers of living water and I'm not experiencing that. And you gotta go and you gotta take your faith in Christ and you gotta go and untap that well. You gotta take it like a pickaxe and crack through the crust of your unbelief and the crust of your circumstances so that that river of living water can flow out from the inside of you and you can experience life fully immersed and fully filled in Christ. Christian, this is what your life is about. Jesus said another weird thing. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. That sounds weird. There's no joke there. That's just weird. Confused people for the longest time. What does that mean? So often, we feast and we root on the stuff Jesus does for us instead of Jesus himself. And so it's like, oh, Jesus gave me a job. I'm happy. I'm good. And like 48 hours, 72 hours, a week later, we're, what did he do? And we're, we're, we're floating. We're rooted in midair again. Oh, Jesus is good in my family until, you know, we forgot about that. What are you? You're not rooted in Christ. You're just rooted in your situation. And as long as God's blessing your situation, you're fine or you look fine. But what Jesus wants us to be is the kind of people who can drink him in deeply, who love him deeply, 
who are enveloped by him, who are indwelt by him, and who are committed fully to him. This all sounds mystical and like it's beyond the vanishing point of your reason. That's because it is. That's because it is. This is what union with Christ is like. And without it, we would have no Christ at all. You experience union with Christ when you receive him. Some of you, you're here and you're checking out Christianity, you're peeking over the fence, like, what's that all about? See if you've well-dressed people, a couple of really messed up people, and a really handsome guy with a face mic. Um, <laughs> like, what's this all about? It's about Jesus. It's about life in Jesus. It's about forgiveness in Jesus. It's about grace from Jesus. It's about commitment to Jesus and knowing and experiencing and loving Jesus forever and always. And if you don't like Jesus, heaven is going to be very, very disappointing for you. Because it's Jesus. Every channel, Jesus. <laughs> Every store, Jesus. Everything you wear, made by Jesus. All the food, Jesus. All the pictures, Jesus. Okay, it's everywhere. All the art, Jesus. The sun, no sun, because there's Jesus. Everything is Jesus. And if you don't like Jesus, then this is all just going to be, it, it's, it's not going to be like golf forever. That's my personal hell. Golf forever. In Florida, in hot. Why people retire to Florida to play golf? I mean, it's, it's hell. It's a thousand degrees and a million percent humidity. Why, why would you do that? It's not related to the text. I'm just throwing that out there for you to think about when you hit 65 and you're doing your retirement planning. How do you, how do you experience union with Christ? You receive him. You plant the roots of your life in him. You let those roots drink Christ in and you grow and you bear fruit in him. So I don't know where you are in there. Maybe, maybe you've never been established in Christ. Maybe you've never received Christ as Lord, as treasure, as better, as Savior. This is the day. This is the day for you to do that. If you're not yet a follower of Christ and you're peeking over that fence and you're saying, okay, today is my day. Okay. It can happen right now. Maybe you, you received him, but somehow like you, you, one of those roots kind of went over here and started drinking deeply of your own intelligence or just being spiritual or just being religious. No, no, we want to cut that off and we want to root you in Christ. Maybe you've been rooted in Christ, but there's no, you've, you've never actually taken him up. You've never studied the word of God. You've never let fullness in the spirit and fullness in Jesus Christ really em envelop who you are. And so you're not growing. Wherever you are, it's time to be rooted and established and grown in Christ. And so the invitation to you this morning is to receive him to be established in him, to grow in him. What do you need? What do you need? You stagnant man or woman of God? Time to grow. Time to plant in Christ. You living up and down because of your situation? Time to pull yourself out of your situation and plant in Jesus Christ. You've never become a Christian before? This is all just new to you? Okay, time to receive Jesus Christ. Because wherever you are and whatever you're struggling with, the answer is Jesus Christ. Not from a distance. Christ in you. Christ all the way around you. For the good of you and the glory of God forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, my friends here need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need to be rooted and established in Jesus. So God, some of us, we have laid the roots of our soil in, or the, root, the roots of our lives in bad soil. And, and God, we, we want to repent of that. If, you, if that's you this morning and, and you have planted your life in just bad soil and you're ready to take your, your life and plant it fully in Christ, I, just, I want to pray for you. I just want you to raise your hand. You want to plant your life in Christ. Maybe even for the first time. You want to receive Christ. You want to follow Christ. You want to love Christ. And you want to be rooted and established in Christ. Keep your hand up. I want to, I want to pray for you. I want to extend my faith for you. God, you see these men and women. Praise God for men and women who are getting new life in Christ, who are getting established in Christ, who are getting rooted in Christ today. God, I pray just as, like, a, like a good gardener, you would come and just take their lives, pull them up out of the soil of their situation and plant them in Christ. Now, if that's you this morning and you, you want to plant your life in Christ, I, just, I want you to pray this with me where you are. Jesus, I love you. And I want to receive you now as my Lord, as my treasure, as my Savior. I want to be rooted in you. 
I want to be filled with you, and I want to grow up to be like you. Now, if you prayed that with me this morning, then this is the first day of the rest of your life. And we rejoice with you. Now, some of you in here, you're not there. You, you've been planted, but you're not growing. And, 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 and if that's you, and you want to be built up in Jesus, you're, you're ready to receive some nutrients from Christ, have a new well of grace unstopped in your life, I, I want you to put your hand up. I want to pray for you. If you're ready to have some life of Christ flow into you this morning, I want to pray for you. God, you see my friends here. And God, whatever, whatever stoppage, whatever blockage there is in their lives right now, we just remove it in Jesus' name, and I pray for new life to flow in Christ. God, that they would be filled with all the fullness in Christ, to overflow. Jesus, we love you, and we receive you this morning, fully immersed, fully established, fully enveloped, and fully changed by Jesus for Jesus. Now, will you stand with me? Let's all stand. We're going to participate in the other covenant sign. It's not baptism. It's communion, where we remember what Jesus did, and then we feast on Christ. We take his body, and we take his blood, and we receive them into ourselves as signs of a greater reality. No, this isn't the actual body and blood of Christ, but there's something supernatural that happens when we come in faith saying, Jesus, come and fill me. Jesus, come and change me. Jesus, come and unstop new wells of grace in me so that I might be fully immersed and established in you and grow up to all the fullness in you. And if you're a man or woman of God, that's what this means for you. So as we sing, we want you to come and do that. But if you prayed this morning to receive Christ for the first time, I'm going to be standing right here, and I want to, I want to pray for you. I want to ask you, instead of coming up here, I want you to come and pray with me. So wherever you are this morning, you have a next step. Let's worship God, and let's experience all the fullness of life with Christ, in Christ, for Christ. We love you, God.